Hi, and welcome to Really with Tom and Dave. And uh, let's get right to it. Tom, uh, tell them what we're doing. It's it's a huge moment for us here on Really. Uh, we have George Knapp with us, who is Nevada's best known journalist. Uh, since 1995, George has been the chief reporter on Channel 8's I-Team investigative unit. In that capacity, he has earned five regional Edward R. Murrow Awards and two national Edward R. Murrow Awards for his investigative stories, and is a nine-time winner of the Associated Press Mark Twain Award for Best News Writing. His investigative reports have been awarded the highest honors in broadcast journalism, including the DuPont Award from Columbia University and the Peabody Award twice. He also has won 28 regional Emmys. In 1990, his series about UFOs was selected by United Press International as Best in the Nation for Individual Achievement by a Journalist. He has co-authored several books on the UAP topic, including Dreamland, an autobiography with Bob Lazar, Hunt for the Skinwalker with Colm Kelleher, and Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, an insider's account of the secret government program, which kept me up many nights with James Lakatsky and Colm Kelleher and a brand new, just released follow-up called Inside the U.S. Government Covert UFO Program, Initial Revelations, also co-authored with James Lukatsky and Colm Kelleher. Uh, if there is a Mount Rushmore for UAP investigative journalism and the fight for disclosure, the first face you should see is this man right here, and we are beyond thrilled to have him with us today. Um, just out of curiosity, who would be on your Mount Rushmore? Dave Foley. Well, yeah, it goes without saying, right? Yeah. But and but after your polite answer, <laughs> um, Robert Bigelow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Harry Reid. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Bob Lazar. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll save the last. I'll, I'll save the last spot. I, I haven't decided <laughs> okay. who else. Would go yeah, ahead. yeah, that'll yeah. be the wild the wild card yeah. spot. Yeah, They'll, yeah, people can compete for that. That's really interesting, Harry Reid. What would you say is his his impact on this 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 subject. Well, I think everything that's unfolding right now um, stems from Reed and what he did and what happened in this town. I mean, as hard as it is to believe, Las Vegas became the unofficial UFO research capital of the country of the world, uh, and had held that title, unofficial title, for probably thirty years um, because of what Reed did with Bigelow in getting the OSAP program funded, the largest that we know of government funded UFO study in history. Yeah. Uh, you know, he he did it. If it, if not for him, none of these things that are happening now would be a, would be happening. We wouldn't have had hearings, we wouldn't have Arrow or uh, uh, the revelations that came out in December of 2017 from Lou Elizondo. None of that stuff would happen. Wow. All right. Well, I'm I'm going to ask that we back up a little bit uh and go to go to kind of your start here. I'm yes. I'm I'll paint the picture. I think there's a young fresh-faced uh, George Knapp. Hard to believe. <laughs> uh, arrives in Las Vegas, very much like uh, Gene Kelly in the Gotta Dance sequence. Uh, I think Bugsy Siegel has just built the Flamingo. Uh, it's a mob run town and a young man comes to town. And George Knapp, of course, you're many years later than Bugsy Siegel. <laughs> but so you get here, you don't come here. Uh, I guess you, what, what, what is your goal when you, when you first get to Vegas? Um, it's a funny story. I, I guess it's, it's funny to me now, but I fl we flipped a coin. I mean, I flipped mm -hmm. a coin about, I wanted to move to Hawaii. I like, mm -hmm. uh, I'm a hedonist. I like the beach. I like green stuff and ocean breezes. That's where I wanted to go. And, uh, but the coin said otherwise, it said Las Vegas. I had, I had met these bartenders from Las Vegas in Berkeley. I'd been, I'd been the debate coach at UC Berkeley for a year and had done it two years prior to that. And I was tired of being broke and figured maybe it's time to go to work and get a real job and make some money. And uh, these bartenders have said, we know a guy in television. You know, you can read and you speak well. And there's a guy in television in Las Vegas. You should go there and uh, he can help you break in. So, oh, yeah, OK. Mm. All right. Yeah. And uh, and moved here because that's what the coin flip said. And uh, the guy in television was a production manager at the PBS station. So he's not exactly a muckety muck in the TV world. But I went and introduced myself and said, Jerry and the boys told me to come look you up. And he looked at me like I was kind of crazy because I had zero experience at all. And um, and he said, well, we'll take your application. We'll see what we can do. In the meantime, I'd met this uh, this mob bartender. The only other name I had in Las Vegas, I went to see him. That he, he was friends with these bartender guys. And I said, well, I'm going to be here and try to break into television. Uh, he says, what do you want to do in between? You want a job? I said, yeah, like doing what? You want to drive a cab? I said, well, I've been here two days. I don't know my way around from <laughs> anywhere. 
just don't worry about it. The guy at the end of the bar, give him $300. <laughs> and uh, you can be a cab driver. Were you and a little I did. concerned about the mob bartender <laughs> part of it? Or did you know? I, mean, I didn't know about the mob okay, so much. Yeah. You know, yeah. I knew he had connections, but I didn't. I figured that was old news. It was, uh, you know, <laughs> sure. that was something that was a bygone era. It was not. <laughs> Turns um, out. So I, I give this guy this money. He sends me to a cab company. They said you need to get a license. They send me to the state taxi cab authority, and they give you a little test, like ten questions of, how would you get from the airport? airport to the showboat hotel. Well, I flunked all of them. I didn't know a single <laughs> yeah. one. And the lady looks at it. She says, hold on a second. This is the back room, comes back out, stamps it. Okay, you passed it. <laughs> I didn't know how far $300 went. Yeah. Uh, so it's not exactly like getting a London cabbie's license. No. <laughs> you, don't no. Have to, you don't have to have the knowledge. No. Well, I think you probably are supposed to, but <laughs> yeah. I didn't. So I was the worst cab driver in the world. Seven hours to the airport months. was your usual. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, hilarious, some of the rides I took. But I only did that for a couple of months, and then they hired me at this PBS station, KLVX, as a part-time production assistant. So I was toting boxes and mixing cement, and then I did studio camera stuff. And each day, I'd go back into the newsroom and kind of bug them. And I would, they had what was called these morgue files, which was newspaper clippings of uh, prominent news stories at the time. And as I'm going through them, I recognized some of the people. The first people I met in Las Vegas were these mob people. Uh, the, the girlfriend I had at the time uh, took a job at a nightclub called the Oz, which was the hot spot in town. And all the mob guys that you, all the names and figures from the movie Casino, that's where they were. So Lefty Rosenthal, Tony Spilatro, Joey Cusimano, I got to meet all of them. And I'm, I'm at the morgue file going through it at KLVX. It goes, holy crap, these are all my buddies. <laughs> I know these guys. And it really, you know, I wasn't doing mob stories. I wasn't doing any stories at the time. But later on, when I became a reporter, it really helped out a lot. Yeah. What an amazing resource to have when you're doing those. I mean, yeah, or, or is it a double-edged sword? Was it? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, because that's the thing people, a lot of people don't know, that you did investigative stories about the mob. I, we did. We all did. So, yeah. you know, I was there at, at KLVX. They finally got tired of me bugging them and they sent me out with a camera to do a story. And uh, so I I did it. I was I did OK with it. And then they let me do more stories. And then about six months in uh, the Anchorman, they had a twice weekly newscast. The Anchorman resigned and left and there was an opening for it. I figured, well, how hard can this be? You know, so <laughs> I applied for it and got it. <laughs> And then I was there for a year uh, learning the tricks of the trade and learning the town and, and what journalists are supposed to do. And I got hired away by Channel 8. And uh, we all did mob stories then. I mean, because um, there was so much happening. It was the, the beginning of the end when the uh, FBI, state gaming agents were really cracking down. It was like an exorcism to get the mob out of the casinos here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we there, every day was a perp walk, a bust, um, a trial, a gaming control hearing, something like that. And yeah, I covered people that I ended up knowing. Yeah. yeah. And is that, I mean, was that was that hard? Was there a loyalty there? I mean, were there times where you felt torn between the job and the friendship? Not or? really. It was more useful than anything because okay. they would talk to me. It wouldn't be on camera, but they would at least give me some other insight into uh, yeah. there is another side to this. And uh, so- Was it, it risky reporting that? Yeah. Well, yeah. My my mentor, my my boss, Ned Day, was also my running buddy. We used to go out and get into trouble together, and um, he 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 tortured these guys. He he was also a columnist for the Review Journal, and would write the most scathing stuff, making fun of these, giving them bad nicknames, and um, it was dangerous. And mm -hmm. you know, he did get targeted. Uh, we we went out one time uh, nightclubbing and went into this place, Steve Sharippa. The actor Ooh, yeah, was Steve. the doorman. Was the he was the doorman there at, the, at this club, and he had handed us a little uh, a slip of paper that was like a wanted poster with Ned's face on it, and it was basically if you see this guy, do him harm. And uh, Ned kind of mm -hmm. laughed about it. Uh, <laughs> he would he would go to these mob hangouts and just beg them to mess with him. He wrote a column about the death of Tony Spilatro when Spilatro was killed. He and his brother were dumped into a hole in a cornfield uh, or beaten brutally. He writes this column about him, and uh, the next night his car was firebombed, uh, mm -hmm. which he, he loved it. It was the best thing that ever happened to him, except he <laughs> lost his favorite golf clubs in, in the explosion, but uh, in the fire. But mm -hmm. Ned thought, that's confirmation that I'm finally getting under their skin. So he, he dug it. 
And he died in 1987 on a trip to Hawaii. There were a lot of people who thought it was foul play. I went over to, to do the story on his death, followed, retraced his steps everywhere he had gone, tried to figure out if, uh, if there had been some kind of foul play. And I, I, don't think, uh, I don't think so. He had a history of heart problems. He, had a, he was snorkeling with, if you knew Ned Day, the idea of him snorkeling is ridiculous, but he died of natural causes, I think. Yeah. Although for years, people would, would call up and say to me, like the same thing that happened to him could happen to you as if they had something to do with it when yeah. they, were, they were full of crap. Well, I think a lot of those sea turtles are connected. Yeah. So, yeah, I've, yeah. Heard of, I've heard about those. Yeah, well, that's amazing. Yeah, it was and an I, amazing time. And yeah. I got to say, yeah, prob I'm thinking probably when you're you're taking on the mob, yeah, it's a little riskier than say getting trolled by UFO Twitter. Yeah, like you yeah, know, that's true. So uh, you know, that, uh, so I assume that built up a lot of uh, sort of calluses. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, you have to have tough skin to be a reporter in this town. Yeah. Is the mob scarier or the alien scare? I mean, is that what's what's the what's a scarier beat? You know, the mob was never um, threatening to me. I mean, it was, there was a certain amount of risk in doing these stories because you never knew who would take offense. But uh, uh, you try to be fair and accurate, and they knew we were generally non-combatants, you know, mm -hmm. so right. it wasn't except for Ned. Yeah, except for Ned. Did yeah. he think the 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 fact that he was kind of a public figure and in journalism was a shield for him? I mean, did that was that. Was he testing, sure, but testing it, the strength of that? There was a certain foolhardy aspect to it. He was he was asking for trouble, mm -hmm. and um, you know he 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 got it. Uh, there was yeah. another attempt on his life another time that he didn't even publicize uh, while he was at a mob joint in San Diego. But um, uh, he he seemed to uh, welcome it. Mm -hmm. And but now you know it was Ned who uh, I guess it's because he it was a story he didn't want to cover that kind of changed your life, right? Yeah, that's true. You know. That's exactly right. Uh, so it was in 1987, a guy named John Lear walks into the newsroom with a stack of documents for Ned. And John had credibility with us. He was the son of Bill Lear, who developed the, the Lear jet, of course, okay. who had friends all through the defense industry and the aviation industries. Uh, he had also developed, I think, the eight-track tape, mm -hmm. industrialist, well-connected, and John had forged his own path. He'd been a world-class pilot. He'd flown pretty much every plane in the in the skies. Uh, he had flown for the CIA during the Vietnam era, and uh, he had helped us break a really big story. He and a group of people would go out into the desert around a place that I came to be known as Area 51 mm. uh, and Area 52 in Tonopah and look in the sky to see secret airplanes. They knew those were the places where they were tested and developed. And they had told us about a plane that was invisible to radar. And at the time, nobody ever heard of the F-117, the Nighthawk. Uh, but they gave us that information. Ned and my other, my news director, Bob Stodall, broke the story. Ned had been pulled in by the FBI and put under a bright light. And where'd you get that information kind of stuff? And don't you know you've endangered the security of uh, 200 million Americans, that kind of stuff? And uh, his attitude was, look, I did you a favor. If I could find out about it, than the Russians certainly could. So um, Ned had knew Lear, had that story. So when Lear walked in with a pile of stuff, he took a look at it. He reads a couple of pages of what turns out to be UFO documents, pushes it back across the desk and said, look, this can't be true. If it was true, I'd already know about it, mm -hmm. which is you know the attitude of a lot of journalists. I was eavesdropping at the time. I said uh, to Lear, I'd never met him. I said, hey, uh, let me take a look at that stuff. And I read through it. And uh, he left the pile. I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. I had never paid any attention to UFOs. I had no idea that there had been these secret studies and government programs. Um, you know, that before FOIA was the law of the land, the Freedom of Information Act, if you were to call up the U.S. Army, the U.S. Air Force, the CIA, and ask for their files on UFOs, they'd laugh at you. The, the FBI, we, we have never studied it. We have no files. Then after FOIA becomes the law of the land, they were forced to release hundreds, thousands of pages mm. where, in fact, they had been studying it, had been investigating it, took it seriously. What they told each other behind closed doors is this is serious. It's, it's real. These things are from somewhere else. They can outperform anything we've got, and we need to figure this out. What they told the public was, there's nothing to it. Move along, folks. Nothing to see here. So and so simultaneous that, plans on their part, right? Like yeah. to, to look at, because that seems like these documents, like at the very, just as you said, they're like, okay, let's make sure they say this. And so that's a, 
purposeful, willful yeah. strategy. Yeah. It really, it was lying. And yeah. if, if there's one thing that really hooked me on the topic, it's that, is, yeah. is that they were lying to us. And I thought, well, gosh, this is pretty interesting. I, at the time, I produced a, a talk show, a 30-minute show called On the Record. It would air 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock on a Saturday, Sunday morning. Normally, I'd have like a gaming control board uh, member or a city councilman or a county commissioner talk politics, a show that had a, a small following, put it that mm -hmm. way, politely. But, you know, uh, some people would watch it. Most people wouldn't. I put I put Lear on the show and I let him go. And I had no idea where this interview was going. And it comes spilling out. And I, I didn't know what the heck to, to think about all this UFO cover-up stuff and treaties with aliens and uh, a lot of really wild stuff. But the reaction from the public was overwhelming, surprisingly strong. Uh, the phone's ringing off the hook. People are asking, what was the deal on that guy? Is that for real? And I, I had to admit, I don't know. You know. So I started doing some reading about UFOs. I had Lear on a second time in 88, and the response was even bigger. I had him on a third time, and it really got wild because in that one, he hinted that he knew somebody who had just been hired to work out at this base called Area 51 in the Nevada desert, and uh, and he thought he was going to work on flying saucers. What he was talking about was Bob Lazar, although I didn't know the name at the time. What if I can't? What was the general gist of the documents he handed you? I mean, what what was a lot they, of FOIA type stuff, okay. like the, the Twining memo, mm -hmm. uh, the Nathan Twining memo. I think he had the Rand. There was a Rand Corporation study. There was some stuff on the Robertson panel that the okay. CIA had used as a reason to get rid of. Uh, the UFO topic altogether, tried to discredit it, yeah. things like that. Okay. It's like, the, I think the content of that interview has almost become the Old Testament of <laughs> the UFO community. Yeah, well, right now. you know, Lear, you have to take Lear with a yeah. grain of salt, uh, as I learned painfully over the years. But uh, so much of what he said then resonates now. The same kind of themes are, are running through a current coverage of the UFO issue. Yeah, and it's, I guess, it's interesting that the, with FOIA, it's almost like FOIA. <laughs> brought all that stuff out into the open, but it also really heightened the secrecy. Yeah, because they got good at it. You yeah. know, they, they were writing these memos and reports to each other, different parts of the government, the military, saying, being very candid what they, what they were thinking about the UFO issue at the time. Hey, these things are from somewhere else. They're not ours. We don't think they're Russians. They're more advanced than anything we've got. They would say those kinds of things. Um, but they don't say that anymore. They don't mm. put that in documents anymore. Yeah, so mm. the paper trail dried yeah. up once FOIA happened. Yeah. Yeah. And how did so how did John Lear know of Bob Lazar? It's a circuitous sort of a route, but uh Gene Huff, who was Bob's really good friend, he was a real estate appraiser, and he uh was doing a real estate appraisal for Lear, who wanted to refinance his home. And he had seen Lear on on the record, and okay. so they got into a UFO conversation. And I think Gene even did that appraisal in exchange for a pile of documents, UFO documents. Mm -hmm. he, that's how he built them. So they struck up a friendship. And Gene had done some work with Bob Lazar. Lazar had a, a photo processing machine, and he would do photo work for real estate companies. And that, that's how the two of them became friends. And then uh, Liz, Lear, Lazar in those days was anti-UFO, thought it was all nonsense. There were a lot of people who knew him back then who could testify to that and have. And uh, he met with Lear. I, I know that in the years since the story came out, Lear has been portrayed as sort of this Machiavellian guy who was the puppet master behind the whole thing, which is not an accurate uh, description of what their relationship was like. Lazar was very skeptical of, uh, of uh, UFOs in general thought that a lot of what Lear claimed was nonsense. They were friends, but it wasn't like Lear controlled him or the other way around. They just knew each other. And uh, when Lazar got hired out there and things started going south for him, uh, he was thinking about reaching out to me because I'd done these shows with Lear and he, he knew that I, it seemed like I was taking it seriously. Uh, but that's another part of the story. Well, are you, I mean, at that point, if, it, when he, that when that introduction takes place, are you you know are you okay? I'm in. I'm kind of in this like in for a penny, in for a penny. Like am I you know or how, how far Kinda. do I want to take this? So it was May of 1989, and I was the anchor of our five o'clock newscast, and uh, we would have a five minute live interview segment in each of those newscasts, and sometimes it'd be people like George Carlin or something coming into town. Sometimes it'd be politicians 
mob busters, uh, things like that. Whoever that was on that day that we had scheduled canceled. And I'm trying to think, what the hell can we fill this with? And I called up, I thought of Lear. I wonder what his UFO buddy, the guy who's supposedly working out there, what's going on with him? I had no idea what had been going on in, mm -hmm. in Lazar's life. Didn't know his name. Didn't know what he'd been going through, but uh, it just so happened the timing coincided. It's like Providence because he was at a point in his life where he thought he was going to be killed. And so I called up Lear. I said, hey, what about your buddy out who works out there in the desert? Would he talk to us? Let me find out. He calls me back in 15 minutes. Within an hour, we had a live truck up at Lear's house and we set up this live interview for five o'clock. And really, I had no idea what, what he was going to say. I had a general idea that he was going to claim knowledge of crash saucers out there in the desert. Uh, but man, what came spilling out was amazing. So we do this live interview with this guy we called Dennis. He didn't want to use his re real name. Dennis was the first name of his boss out there. So it was kind of an inside joke and a stab at them. And he told us the story that we've got a, a base called S4 uh, near, Groom, uh, near Groom Lake. Uh, not actually the Groom Lake Area 51, what the world knows is that, but adjacent to a place called Papoose Lake that they, they had a series of hangars built into the side of a mountain disguised to look like the desert. And then each of these hangars had a flying saucer like they had the variety pack. There were nine of them. He said he had worked on one and it was we were taking them apart to figure out how they worked as opposed to building them. It was, I remember calling it reverse archaeology because I'd never heard the term reverse engineering, but that's what it was, a reverse engineering that's a cool program. cool term though, reverse, yeah. like reverse archaeology. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, so he told that story and it landed like a bomb. Our newsroom, everybody was glued to the television. The phone started going crazy. I get pulled off the set. Um, the general manager hauls, hauls into a, the news director's office and say, what is the deal on that? What, is that true? I said, <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, I don't know, you know but I'll, I'm going to find out. So may that I, weekend. May I ask what your first impression of, of Lazar was? Like when, if you first meet him, is he calm? Is he Mild calm? mannered, understated, careful, scared. You mm -hmm. know, he was scared. That was my overwhelming impression. Uh, that weekend, uh, Bob Stodall, the news director and I went up to Lear's we're going to get to the bottom of this and figure this out. And so we were told we could meet this guy in person. Lear liked to play games. So he wanted to be in control of this meeting. He wouldn't tell us Bob's name. And he wanted us to ask the questions through him, even though Lazar's sitting there in the room. The thing is, in Lear's uh, entryway, his foyer, there's a guest book and he'd have people sign it. So when I walked in, I saw uh, Lazar's name in there. So I already knew what it was. <laughs> and... Um, so I said, John, you can, you can knock this off. We already know what his name is. So then we started the conversation and we went through about three, three and a half hours, I think, of questions. Where'd you go to school? Where'd you work? What's your employment history? Um, how did you get hired up there? And got the whole story. And we walked out a couple hours later looking at each other going, holy crap, what if this is true? I mean, this would be the biggest story in history. Uh, but we also recognized and said it at the time. This is also risky for us. I mean, we do this, it could blow up on our faces, um, hurt not only my reputation and his, but the newsroom, the, the news op station could really do some damage. So we'll take our time. We'll dig into this. We'll do it right. And I spent the next seven months doing UFO research. And I, it was a, I'd already been reading some books and, and digging into it a little bit, but it was a very intense learning curve. And oh my gosh, you know, this, it's a huge, it's a huge undertaking. It's not just lights of the sky, um, you know, to figure out who's credible, what's real, what's nonsense, and uh, separate wheat from chaff to sort of see where Lazar's claims fit into the big picture. Right. I never heard about reverse engineering and crash saucers. I didn't know about Roswell. I didn't know any of that stuff. But uh, after a while, we sort of sort of got the feel of where it fit into the bigger picture. And we, we had said at the time, hey, maybe this could be a multi-part series, you know, like three or five parts, three or four minutes a night. It ended up being nine parts when we unleashed it in, um, in November of 1989. And each of those parts were 12 to 14 minutes long, which for a local newscast, those are really long oh, yeah. stories. Mm -hmm. And by the end, I was writing them the night, the day of the stories and trying to get them on the air because it was, it was a, it's a monster of a project, but it was the highest rated local news series or project that's ever aired on, on local television. And each night the audience got bigger. And 
it was there was something called Paranet in those days where people were making transcriptions and sending them out around the world um, every night of those episodes and people were pirating the, the uh, stories and uh, were showing them in movie theaters and it was it was a sensation. We realized we had a tiger by the tail kind of a thing. Holy cow, this really touches the pulse of the public in ways that I had never really appreciated before. Sorry, I got off on a tangent. That's no, not, no, no, it's a great tangent. What uh, yeah. was there and was there any particular like uh oh moments that you had during that? With, you know, oh, very much so. Yeah, you know, where we yeah maybe got well maybe we've gotten too far ahead of ourselves on this. Yeah, or? well with Lazar. Yeah, you know we ran into that immediately. Uh, he had given me this resume. I brought a copy of it. I'll, I'll show it to you. Uh, his resume at the time it was hilarious in the in the sense of the kinds of things that he thought were funny that he put in the resume that he sends out with his job applications because he had on there something about um, his interest in jet cars. And it was also something about a part owner of a, a legal brothel at the time. Like, that's mm -hmm. really good. You want to send that to Los Alamos <laughs> lab. Um, he had told us he had been at Los Alamos and had worked there as a physicist on classified stuff. And uh, he also had claimed to be have advanced degrees from Caltech and MIT. That's where I started. And both said, we never heard of him. I thought, uh-oh, this could end really quickly. Right, yeah. Here. yeah. He, uh, you know, and, and we tried to figure out how we're going to deal with that issue if the school's denied. He says, well, look, I, I was there in, in a certain capacity. I've got friends who can tell you that. I, he said, look, go focus on Los Alamos. And that's what I did is if he worked at Los Alamos in a scientific uh, capacity and he had a clearance, then he must have gone to school somewhere. So look at Los Alamos. And I wrote to Los Alamos multiple times, called him, wrote to him. I mean, I got a stack of, of uh, letters mm -hmm. and correspondence that I've, I've sent to them and to their contractor, Kirkmeyer, company that hires people to work there. And they said, no, we never heard of him. The, the lab, we don't have any indication that he ever worked here, not for the lab or that he'd ever worked here at all. And I go back to Lazar, are, are you sure? And then I found the lab phone book the lab phone book from when he was there, and there's his name in the lab phone book. Uh, went back to him, you know, nope, we have no records of him. Uh, then I found the newspaper article, front page article in the Los Alamos Monitor. You know, Los Alamos is not a big town, it's not a big city. The front page story about Bob and his jet car. He'd put a jet engine in a Honda, and he was well known all over town, and they, they reported that he is a physicist at the lab. Now, that's not the kind of thing you can get away with in a, in a small town like that. So I went back to the Los Alamos again. What about these? Sorry, no records. So then I went to Kirkmeyer, which is the company that had hired Bob. It's a, like a headhunter company that fills positions at National Labs. And I asked them, did, do you, did you guys hire Lazar? You got Bob Lazar, Robert Scott Lazar. Yeah, we hired him. We got him for that job. I said, can I get the paperwork? You must have some kind of background information on him. They said, yeah, if you get a signed statement from him, we'll give it to you. And I did. And then a month goes by, no response. Another month goes by, no response. I called them up again. Uh, they were jacking me around. I started sending them letters. Hey, you said I could have this stuff. Where is it? And eventually what came out is we don't have it anymore. Now, I think it's bullshit because that's, their, that's what their business that's is. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. It's finding jobs for people. So the lab jacked me around, the Kirkmeyer jacked me around, and I was ticked off about the whole thing. So I think by them trying to um, muddy the waters, they, it had the opposite effect on me. You know, it really, really got my dander up. Yeah. Because as well, an unnecessary denial, yeah. you know, is, is, yeah, is information. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, it was hard to document his, his background, but I went to the lab. Lazar took me into Los Alamos. We went there on a weekend and we get in his car, myself and a photographer, and we roll right through the gate. He waves at this guy at the gate goes on in, we park, we wander around in all these buildings, and Bob is like a rabbit in his burrow, showing us around where this is, where that is. He obviously knew his way around. People would see him and wave at him. He took us into the, the uh, Mason facility, which is the world's largest, one of the world's largest uh, superconductors, particle accelerator. And, uh, and we took video. I did stand-ups outside the lab. I mean, for a guy who wasn't at the lab, he sure knew his way around the lab mm -hmm. and knew people there and they let him in. So, you know, I, I, it was clear to me something was wrong. I talked to people who had worked with him there and he had been there and they were lying about it and I was hooked. 
Yeah. And the runaround you were getting is almost a kind of, it, it's like a, an adjacent confirmation. Yeah. You know, it's they're, they're, they're saying there's something here by not saying that something's exactly. here. Exactly, yep. Yeah. That's, that's wild. Um, and and did you have, would, would people come forward in terms of the crop of like, yes, we worked with Bob or? A couple, couple of them, um, nobody wanted to go on the record, but a couple of them, their names are well now known, you know, people that he had worked with. There was a guy named Joe Vananetti who, who worked with him there. Um, his wife had been there at the lab. Uh, other people in town knew him, both from the lab and from his uh, photo. And out. He had bought some photo processing equipment or something as a side gig, and people knew him from that as well. So we mm -hmm. had enough that we were confident that they, in fact, he had been there and that they were lying to us, and that actually bolstered his credibility. Yeah, and is it frustrating now because uh, in light of what's gone on with David Grush, the Bob Lazar story has, has become uh, uh, focused again, but the, there's still all those people who just, discredit him and dismiss him and say, well, you know, he lied about his education and he lied about working at Los Alamos and they don't do the research and find out what you found out. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, people look at Bob's life and figure there's no way he could ever get a clearance. I know there are some obvious there. He's a he's a, a rebel. He's a you know, when I met him first time I went to his house, he had a pirate flag flying up on, on top of his <laughs> home. He had a big jet car sitting in the, in the driveway. He had produced videos for rock stars. He liked machine guns. He had a penchant for hookers and uh, it was flashy women. I mean, this is not a guy that you would think would be hired to work in a most top secret classified program ever, unless you look at it at a different light. If you wanted somebody who could think outside the box, if you had a problem and you weren't making scientific progress, you weren't getting anywhere on it, you need somebody who is smart, but who could also be discredited if you needed to do it, then Bob might have been perfect candidate. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you yeah, you couldn't really bring in the top most prominent physicists to work oh. on, on a secret project where you in the back of your head you're thinking, well, if we have to kill him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, you know. it, it's that's exactly right. It was so stovepiped, and still is, by the way. They can't bring in the best people. It's a very limited number of people who can know and I think that is very much related to why we have been able to make much progress in figuring out the propulsion. Yeah. And I think Bob's always said, I shouldn't have been the guy brought right. in on this. They should have had somebody better than me here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, although those people probably weren't as good at building flamethrowers <laughs> yeah. and laser guns. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, clearly a brilliant guy and, and yeah, a kind of iconoclast, someone who's going to... Um, how long did he say he worked there? It was only a period of about over seven months. I think seven months is what it was. And he um, he had been out there many times. It would be infrequent. They'd call him in the middle of the night, get ready to go. He'd go report to the Janet terminal and jump on that unmarked plane and fly out there. And he had said a, a lot of interesting things is that, you know, he, he should not have been able to see the things that he was shown. They showed him these briefing books the first day he was there, uh, all this weird technology and alien bodies and He's wondering if this is some kind of a test or something. Right. He remembers walking by a, a hangar and there was what looked like a, a, a small little being uh, talking to some guys. Uh, he just got a flash of it. He walked by a craft and he touched it and they told him, knock that off. Don't do that. Um, and, you know, it was all kind of mysterious and weird. And um, a lot of what happened to him, he just felt didn't make sense. Also, what happened to him is he said they would go out there and there were times when he didn't remember anything that happened uh, at all. It was like a big, great big blank in the middle of his day. He was asked to, to drink some kind of a pine flavored liquid. He recalls that uh, under hypnosis that, uh, that uh, there had been sort of an intimidation program where when he was under, they would uh, drill things into his head and threaten him. Uh, it's, it's a complicated story. I'm not doing a very good job of explaining it, but there was a lot of weird things about his time out there that didn't make sense. Yeah. The, and he thought, and, and as far as the craft that he saw, he said there were not nine, nine, nine. And, and one he thought was, uh, was discovered as an archeolot, like had been dug up. Yeah. I think that's, he didn't tell me that at first. It's sort of something that's kind of, uh, rumbled around in his head for a while. He didn't know where, how we got any of them. There was one, he said they all looked like they were in pretty good condition, if you know what a good condition UFO looks like. There was one that had a great big hole in the middle of it, like it might have been shot down or uh, that they had done a test to see how strong that the metal was. Um, but the rest of them looked like they'd be in operating condition. He saw one fly, the sport model. They, they did some sort of a limited test where it went above the 
the mountain range there and it glowed. Uh, and then, you know, when things started going south uh, for him, they, they had been, while he was upgrading his security clearance, they had his phones tapped. And um, his wife apparently was having an affair with her flight instructor at the time. So they informed him of this. And then that's when he realized that his clearance might be in trouble. They stopped calling him to go out there. And he thought, uh, I'm in trouble here. So he, he started taking friends out to the desert. He wanted a little insurance. And so three weeks in a row, they went out to the desert outside of not Area 51, but S4. And they pointed a, a camera out there because Wednesday nights were the nights of the tests of the sport model. And sure enough, at least on one of these things that was videotaped, they, this thing rises up over the mountains of Papoose Lake, and then it goes back down. It glows. Uh, you know, you can hear them. They're running commentary in the original video. Uh, they were impressed by what they saw. Yeah, and uh, he's out there with, it, that's with Bigelow and- This with, is with Lear, Lear and Gene Huff, and, yeah. I, and think their wives were out there yeah. for one of those trips. Uh, there was three trips in a row. The third time he got caught, and that's when he realized, I'm really in trouble now. Um, so that's that's precisely when I called. You know, right right in that same time frame is is when I called Lear to see if this guy might want to come on on the air and yeah. talk about it. So it was kismet. You know, it was a lot of a lot of things had to come together for that to happen. And yet he'd been getting sort of he had started getting veiled threats. Yeah. At that point. Yeah, they had uh, taken a shot at his car. Um, he was having break-ins at his home. Um, they would come in and move stuff around, wipe out things on his blackboard, move around furniture. He, um, this is when I got to know him too, was he went to a gym one night with his buddy. He was scared. So he was, he was packing an Uzi. He likes guns. And uh, he had an Uzi in his car. It locks Uzi? his car. An Uzi. <laughs> Has it in his car. He goes into the gym with his buddy, comes out an hour later, the doors to the car are open, the windows are rolled down, the glove box is open, and there's the Uzi laying on the seat. Just messing with him, just to let him know that they were around and they were watching. Um, he was scared for yeah. his life. He, that was genuine. I, I, you know, we got to know each other after that Dennis interview. I spent a lot of time with him, and, and uh, both at his home, at Channel 8, and other places we would meet, and we were being followed. We were followed around. And I, he would call me, he'd get home from those meetings and they'd been in his house and he was genuinely frightened. I'd go over there and he's peeking out the window. He's packing that Uzi, looking out to see who's coming in. And it, it's hard to convey what that time was like in between when the Dennis interview happened and the KLS series. It was really scary. Uh, it mm -hmm. was real. And, you're, and, you, and your feeling was this is, this is not a guy cracking up or, but something like that can make, can push someone to be sure like paranoid and whatever mm -hmm. but all, but your feeling was like this is re he's really being pursued because you yourself feel like you were being followed yeah um and i'll, I'll get into yeah. that in a minute um yeah i mean maybe one of the aims was to make him crack up or make him look like he was cracking up so that he wouldn't get any more credibility with us or right. anybody else who might be digging into his story uh, but you know at that point i was i was pretty hooked and and it felt to me like it was real and I learned for sure it was real later on. We had, when we went on the air and I put these stories on, I made an open appeal to Las Vegas. I said, look, I know there's people listening to this program right now who know about this program, who know about what's out there in the desert. And I'm asking you to come forward and help, and help us out. And a bunch of them did. I had more than, I think, 24 different people who had been out, out at Groom Lake at one time or another in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, who had seen bits and pieces of the, of the same thing, either saucers or something like it, landings, uh, hangars, things of that sort. And most of those people would not go on the record with their names, but there were six of them in a row who called me and offered me information. I mean, I'm talking to them on the phone, six, right after another, and the very next day, all six of them were visited by somebody who told them to shut the hell up. One guy was a guy named Roy Byram. He did taxes for people that worked at, uh, area, at, at Nellis. And he got to know some of these guys pretty well. And on, an, on some kind of a trip, an outing, they had talked to him about Roswell and the material from Roswell being out there in the Nevada desert. And he offered to tell me about this on camera. The next day, he gets visited by two guys who said they're from the Secret Service. They're investigating him for threatening to kill the president. And he said, this is bullshit. I didn't threaten to kill the president. Mm -hmm. And he felt he was being intimidated. There was a, a, an engineer 
an electrical engineer who'd worked at KLES, who had also been at Groom Lake, who had told me a story before we were on the air with Lazar that he had been out there and saw what looked like a saucer under a tarp in a hangar. And um, I said, would you, he had moved on to a different city. Would you give us an interview about that story you told me uh, before? And he says, yeah, just black out my face. I don't want my name used. And the next morning he wakes up. There's two guys sitting in a car out in front of his house, making themselves very obvious, talking into a radio. They followed him to work, Jeez. followed him back home. No interview. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lady who worked at the Clark County Courthouse. She was a court stenographer. And this cop I knew had talked to her uh, about UFOs, what she might know. And he told me this story. And then he says, hey, I think she'll talk to you. So I called her and asked her if she would. And the story she told me was she had been a stenographer for a company called Holmes & Narber, a defense contractor that has works a lot of work at the Nevada test site and also on the Nellis range. And she'd sat in on these meetings between Air Force officials and the company at which they discussed crash retrievals, UFOs, crash. And the secrecy was so much that when they'd finish these, uh, these sessions, they'd take the ribbon out of the typewriter or whatever machine she was using to do the stenography and destroy it. And I said, well, would you tell me that? And she said, yeah, she gets visited. Again, the next day after I talked to her on the phone by these two guys who said, you know, you're still subject to your security clearance. She goes, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not telling anybody anything. And then they, they added this. They said, we know that your daughter lives in L L L LA and that you travel back and forth to see her and that she comes to see you. It's a big desert out there. It'd be terrible if something happened to either one of you. It's a threat. She was scared mm -hmm. shitless. I mean, it w and it, it went on for years. I reached out to her again a decade later and she still wouldn't talk to me. Um, wow. And it, the fact that, you know, we now pretty much figure all of our phones all that information goes into some giant supercomputer of the NSA and is stashed away. We all assume that somebody's listening to us all the time. Back then, um, I, I thought that you know a newsroom, uh, you know a CBS affiliate in Las Vegas, uh, you're not going to be bugging our phones, but they were. They bugged my phone, I, and I don't believe that they ever got a, a, a warrant, a judge to sign off on a warrant for that. I think it was just they did it. They wanted to see who was offering to give me information and make sure they could cut them off at the pass. And it really pissed me off. And, yeah. and it makes me think about, you know, cause so much of this is like, well, how is this secret kept for so long? How do they, and yet you think about like, it doesn't take much to scare somebody to death. Like it just doesn't yeah. take much to make someone be like, what, what, what's this worth to me? Like, I, why do I have to be the person that puts my neck out, you know? And there, yes, there'll be some like, some people like you and your friend that, you know, but it, like most people that's, that's they don't they don't want to get into all that and, and yeah. so it's really because I guess easy to keep a secret like that in some well way. easy it's easy in the sense that Easier. it's come out yeah. it has come out well it's true it's been out <laughs> lots of times yeah yeah and people choose to either ignore it or not believe it mm -hmm. um, you know they don't take it seriously there's always the people who keep these secrets are much better at their job than people like me are at ours I mean they it's it's a lot easier to muddy those waters cast aspersions get people to move yeah. on than it is to actually dig in and get some solid info about it, you know? Yeah, well, because all they have to do is present something that sounds plausible to the public and the public go, oh, yeah. that yeah. I don't yeah. need, I'm, and I can now safely ignore all of this mountain of information. Yeah. Exactly, it was exactly I, what my colleagues in journalism, journalism has, have done. Yes. You know, I had been a, I'm not the world's most uh, best reporter or something, but I had done some pretty good stories and had a good reputation in Las Vegas uh, for being a solid guy and you know and my stories were taken seriously and I won a bunch of awards and things this comes along and suddenly I'm the crazy UFO reporter right, right. I, I and I couldn't get it I hey I'm the same guy that did these other stories you you think I'm just I'm being sloppy I'm making this up or that I would be fooled on something of this magnitude that I haven't done my homework I'm the same guy and um the reaction from my journalism colleagues was the harshest of all. Mm -hmm. I, I figured scientists would ignore it and dismiss it. And uh, I knew that the public was interested because everywhere I went, people were talking to me about it. And they'd ask me, hey, do you really believe that stuff? And it wasn't they cared what I believe. They wanted to tell me their UFO story mm -hmm. and, and everyone's got one. Mm -hmm. uh, or that you know somebody in your family has one. So the public couldn't get enough of it. Scientists ignored it. Journalists hated it. Um, they thought I was bringing the, 
the whole profession in disrepute or something. So I got scorched. Well, there, it does on a seem, fairly regular basis. It does seem to be a unique situation where, when it's this subject, the UFO subject, any other subject on Earth, if you have credible people with a, a long history of good work, um, and they take an interest in a subject that might seem a little obscure, then the normal response is, well, if this credible person who we trust on all of these other things is taking this seriously, we should take it seriously. But what if it's the UFO, it's this credible person with this long history of good work is taking this thing seriously. I guess he wasn't really credible and he never really <laughs> did anything in the past that we should pay attention to. Yeah. And it's, it's, I think we're seeing it happen to someone like Avi Loeb even today, yeah. where you have the New York Times writing a, a pretty despicable smear piece on him. Yeah. Well, and Grush, it's happening to Grush. Yeah. You, know, you saw the, the, the slime job that was done on him. Yeah. It was... Uh, it so was you're experiencing this. Oh, man. It was, uh, you know, I was, I was uh, dismayed. Yeah. It, uh, my, and I don't care. I mean, I have developed thick skin over the years. It's a lot thicker now than it was back then. But um, the newspaper columnists just just lambasted me, and the uh, the the radio DJs would every single day with some after belch barf and fart jokes they'd they'd tee off on me. They'd made up songs and poems and and parodies. And all right, you know, I'm I'm sort of a semi public figure. I can take that. I got it. But what really ticked me off was that these are journalists now who haven't done any of the work. Right. They haven't interviewed the witnesses. They haven't read the documents. They certainly haven't sat out in the desert hundreds of nights at a time, as I have done, to look for whatever is flying around in the sky. They just haven't done the legwork, and here they are dismissing the story, and that that's wrong. That's that's not a good. Yeah. That's not good journalism. It's not journalism at all. No. It it's yeah. It's kind of a, a form of ad, advocacy, really. You want to take a stab mm -hmm. at it and come to a different conclusion, knock yourself out, but don't tell me that it's not true unless you've at least given yeah. it a try. And did you consider walking away from this? at that point i mean yeah it must I, be I a personal toll with yeah i mean yeah sure it was not fun and um i guess i did think about it a few times but really i was more angry than anything i was angry about the lies to the public and to me and then the the threats to people to lazar and these other witnesses it really it it uh, i had that had the opposite effect of maybe what was intended because uh it really sunk the the hook in deeper into me do you have family or loved mm. ones at this time going like like, why are you putting yourself through this? No, like, family yeah. was all supportive. Yeah. Were you great. married? Were you married then? At no that point. No. Yeah. No. And and also, you, you, at, at the uh, TV station, you were getting you were getting backup from them. Yes, that's which is that made which all is the amazing. difference in the world. They weren't like that's yeah. that's to their credit. Bob Stodall and well, Ned died in 1987, so he he missed out on this stuff. But um, Bob Stodall, the news director, and then the news directors that followed uh, all supported it. A, the public was interested. Uh, B, we were being careful. I mean, we we're trying to be responsible and you know report what we could know and, and approach it in a, in a responsible way. Follow the paper trail. I mean, if anything, the most persuasive evidence to me was the government documents. That's what got me started in the first place. It's what kept me interested because they think it's real. Right. They know it's real, and I know they know it's real. And so, you know, all the diversions uh, didn't get me off the path. I, I did think about it a couple of times, but I'm glad I didn't. Yeah. And I guess that, I mean, and coming out of this, you then go on an, another, I mean, maybe we, a new a new chapter in your, your journey in this is you go to Russia. And that's a pretty amazing story. This is like not long after you first yeah. So jump um, into this subject. Yeah. Is it, before we do that, is there like, this is the most... If if true and and now because your your analogy of I mean you're saying like you've got the documents they you know they know that it's real and some somebody's seeing stuff they know it and they're studying it so it's like the door's cracked open and then the door's out like if it's cracked open it's yeah. open like it's not that big a leap to assume that they could have debris which would help confirm these documents so now you're dealing with something that is the highest classified thing I mean that can exist right like beyond top secret and you have announced it globally, <laughs> you know, it was there a sense of, was that legal? What I did? Like, was that, was I allowed to do that as the laws of journal? I mean, you're, you yeah, really it's, yeah, uh, unleashed. Well, the, well, we we had a lot of conversations along those lines yeah. at the TV station, but yeah, we figured it was legal. These are documents obtained legally. I'm not revealing uh, classified documents, holding them up and right, leaking them to the Right, not those, right. Bob's yeah. testimony, what, what Bob's saying could potentially be 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are they, and you're, what are they gonna do? Yeah, and you're dealing with a journalistic professional around you who just like you said, you've got the stacks right here next to you. Will won't even look at the material, right? Are it, which seems like almost like you know they did talk about believers and non-believers. You know, this is it's this is the behavior of believers in a non-UFO world. That's right. And they are believers in it, and they're going to protect that belief. They are absolutely just as committed as the craziest saucer nut in the world. They're as committed to their their paradigm uh, yeah. as, uh, without really examining it at all. To the point where you can condition a journalist to refuse to look at evidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty remarkable. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and refuse to listen to a, a, a witness, to look into the background and the credibility of a witness. Somebody like Grush, mm -hmm. you know. Somebody got convinced to go ahead and slime him and bring up stuff, painful things from his past that have absolutely nothing to do with his job performance. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it, I mean, are you aware of, can you think as a journalist of any other story, any other issue that has been treated this way by, by the press? I can, yeah. There's one that I've covered. I don't want to get off too much of a yeah. sidetrack, but the opioid crisis. Mm. Um, you know, there are 10 million Americans who live with chronic pain and opiate medication works for them and it's being taken away and their lives are suffering. Many of them are committing suicide. I mean, it, it allows them to cope. It's not a party drug for them. It allows them to have a normal life, to go to work, to take care of their families. That medication has been taken away because 15 years ago, drug companies uh, allowed uh, excess use, pill mills, things of that yeah. sort, excessive prescriptions has zero to do with people dying uh, from opioids today, but the legitimate patients are suffering. Anyone who wants illegal opiates can find them on any street corner. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a terrible thing. And my profession of journalism has, has perpetuated this and will not look at the other side to this, will, just will not look at it. Yeah. And it's just like, like a conventional wisdom has sunk in that, that people just are like taking the party line. Evil drug companies right. caused this this oh, epidemic and it's still going on, even though the number of prescription medications have gone down every year since 2011 and the number of deaths from opioids has gone up every year since. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so that, yes. So take it. Take... Sorry to get off on that. No, no, no. no you asked me for yeah, examples. Let's, yeah, so no, because I couldn't think of any other, anything else um, where the press, I mean... Obviously, there, there are incidents where the press was negligent on, on the walk up to the first Iran war, you yeah, know, uh, for sure. uh, not Iran, Iraq war. Um, and uh, obviously, the press was uh, used to be complicit in the cover ups of what was really going on in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, but well, but nothing their, quite like the UFO story. They, they don't want their worldview changed. People don't want their world. The harder they fight is usually a sense that you're getting close to something that's really just like hitting the nerve hard. And I just think that there's like that level of resistance only increases the closer you get to, you know, some sort of truth. I, I'm curious of whether from a civilian standpoint of looking at this, it seems like Bob Lazar and that story has, has only kind of, I, I think, strengthened I think from what has been revealed, what would you consider um, the the key relevant pieces through the years that sort of are helping confirm that story or make you feel, and I don't wanna put words in your mouth, like, you know, assuming you feel that story has, has gotten better with age. Well, all the other things that have come out, yeah. all the other aspects of the story, Dave Grush, yeah. Eric Davis, uh, NIDS and uh, OSAP and uh, all, all those programs, Lou Elizondo, all of that, all that information that's come forward bolsters the, the case that Bob Lazar made. Um, we really do have crashed saucers. We've got them stashed somewhere in hangars of aerospace companies and other, other contractors, uh, you know, and the keepers of the secrets, the closer the public gets to the goodies, the harder they're pushing back. And you're seeing it right now. Um, the, the confirmation is all over the place now. Things have been leaking out in a way that are not as easily dismissed as it used to be. It's not just Bob Lazar. A lot of other folks have come forward to say the same thing. Now, some of those people have come forward to say the same thing, say, Lazar's full of crap. He wasn't for real. But what he said turns out to be real. You know, mm -hmm. how, how he knew. There's a disconnect uh, 30, there. Yeah. Six yeah. years later. Well, and in fact, there's, there's even a strategy of let's liken David Grush to Bob Lazar sure. because we've already, dis we've already discredited Bob Lazar. So all we have to do is keep saying, here's another Bob Lazar. Yeah. So we don't even have to do the work on Grush. Yeah, put him in the same box. Yeah, right. and the press pretty much falls in line with it. 
sadly. Yeah. I asked this to Jeremy, I, and I'm just I'm curious about your thoughts. Who are the bad guys? Who are the obstructionists? Like who can we name? Do we know a name, a general uh, agency? What are? Well, I mean, we know a lot of those names, and we know the, a lot of those companies and agencies. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I think this stuff is in private hands now, private companies, as a way to have a further. Um, yeah, another result of FOIA. Yeah, put it somewhere where you right. can't FOIA it and you can't access it, and members of Congress, unless they're really dedicated, are never going to find it. And um, you know, I, I think there's probably a profit motive involved. You know, if I had that stuff, if I'm an X corporation and I've got a flying saucer, I know damn good and well that if I can figure out this propulsion, it's going to change the world. It would be trillions of dollars. Changes the transportation industry, the energy industry. Maybe that's a reason not to have it out. But if mm -hmm. you're a company that has it, do you want to give that up? Yeah. You want to, you're going to have Congress pass a law and you're going to just cough it up? Well, you look at all the money Elon Musk is making by launching primitive uh, chemical propellant rockets. Yeah. You know, if somebody can come along and make that irrelevant. Exactly. Yeah. So, so private industry in conjunction with CIA, Air Force. CIA, Air Force. Yeah. Those are the top of the list. Two big, <laughs> two big guys. Okay. Um, look. And, and maybe the RCMP. Let's get Canadians in there. The, they the always Canadian, get their man. Trying to get, yeah. Always trying to get an angle <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah. Um, we have so much to talk with uh, Mr. Knapp about. So we'll, we're going to get into, I think the next day it should be, we want to talk about Russia. Sure. We've got think, incredibly yeah. cool stuff to look at that he has brought that we can look at, actual materials. You um, sound like you're building up to a break. I'm excited. Yeah. I am building up to a break. It means like we, we get more, more coffee. Do. Well, you got to go yeah. pee. I know you yeah. got to go. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm gonna, but uh, yeah, and then we'll talk about Dave Grush and Skinwalker Ranch. So uh, on our next uh, episode of Really. Really.